Welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much for coming. Um, gee, uh, we've both been around for a while, and I know that you've supported women like I do, and you've said some amazing stuff at panels that I've uh, heard you about, you know, um, e equalizing the playing field, both as investors and um, with startups. Um, so I was wondering if you want to talk a bit about what you're passionate about in the ecosystem. Sure. So, so one of my big passions, as you mentioned, has been change the ratio and getting more women in tech, getting more women into venture capital. In fact, I took a break from venture capital over the last couple of years to step into the CEO role at a company called Hackbright, which is a code school exclusively for women in San Francisco. So we train mid-career professional women in, in the skills of software engineering. It's a mix of software engineering and professional software development skills and then help her launch her new career. Um, so I started in that role in 2015. At this point, we've graduated literally hundreds of women who've gone on to work as engineers in, in top technology companies across the country. I'm really proud of Hackbright. That's fantastic. And um, I know also that you've said some amazing stuff about um, being in boardrooms with men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, my entire career has been in male-dominated yeah. fields. I have two engineering degrees and an MBA, so the, you know, I was often the only woman in my class. I worked as a strategy consultant and then in tech. So I'm pretty used to being around a bunch of men, um, but, but it is funny to be, you know, it, well, being at Hackbright has been really different because... Um, when I first got there, we only had one male employee out of 25. <laughs> so it, it's really interesting, I think, for men to feel that experience of being in, you know, in a sharp minority. All of a sudden, they see your point of view, even without, you know, and just n not that it's bad. It's just a different feeling to feel very different. And I think that's... Um, you know, it's a it's an abstract conversation to have, but as soon as as soon as each of us has the experience of being, you know, in a minority, then you have a lot more empathy for the other side, and you know, for tech or you know, for leadership roles to experience changing the ratio, right? To have more women making investments, to have more women um, in board seats and in leadership roles in companies. It requires the support of the men, right? We need our male, you know, hashtag male ally is, is really, really important because they are, they are in the positions where they can affect change. The, the minority can't affect all of the change. I think men are not the enemy, really. They're, they're just um, a part of the whole ecosystem. <clears throat> and I was remembering when you were talking many years ago in Melbourne, I worked for the Victorian AIDS Council in the heart of the crisis. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day, I don't even know how it happened, I must have gone there for a meeting, and I was in a huge room and it was totally full of men and I was the only woman. I had a physical reaction. I thought I was going to throw up and I had to go outside. Mm -hmm. But it, was, it, it wasn't like, I mean, I loved the men. Men. They were fantastic gay men, but it was just something wrong <laughs> for me. One woman in oh, so many, I don't know, hundreds of men in there, and uh, it was just too much for me. So I, I can imagine that women who sit on boards um, where there's no women and they're the only person, that that can be a bit daunting. What I love about yourself and in the history that I've followed you is that you call it as you see it and you don't, uh, you don't talk bullshit and I really appreciate that and I think other women would also take that lead then and can be honest uh, about what's going on. Right. Well, and we, we fall prey to questioning ourselves and we have to believe that we have a right to belong and, you know, and it, it, it's... Is certain other cultures have that even in uh, you know in much sharper ways. I have a girlfriend who's Japanese, and she came here for business school, which is where I met her, and I helped her get her first job. But it was working on in um, on Japanese products in a tech company, and she kept saying thank you, thank you, thank you. And I finally said, stop thanking me. Like they need you as much as you need them, right? When when we're there for a job interview, when we're there to you know when we're there for work. We're there contributing. We don't have to say thank you. We don't have to be afraid to be there. Um, you know, we have a right to be there. And it, not, a, you know, we have a right, yes, in the militant sense of rights, but also we have things to contribute. And just if you trust that you have something to contribute, you can exhale a little bit, let that stress out, and then, and then share, and then you're going to feel like, I got this. 
and that feeling of stress will fade away. You're a great role model, Sharon. Thank you so much. Tell me what you love to invest in and also what's the secret sauce for you when an entrepreneur comes in and how they're going to grab your attention? Uh -huh. so, um, so at Scale Venture Partners, we really like to invest on a handful of big themes that we think are going to be very important. So we tend to do a fair amount of research, which is pretty hands-on research, out talking to customers and prospects and incumbent companies and trying to figure out actually technology changes that are happening, cost curves that have a, some kind of disruptive shift in them. And then you know find themes where we can make numerous investments on that theme with the you know with the hope that the bundle of companies is going to be on average right right any one particular company might um, might be a winner or loser deal investment but that that trend is an inexorable trend that we're going to be successful on so you know so the firm has invested on the whole shift uh, to developer operations and all these tools that um, that software engineers use now to assemble code into modern applications. Um, we're currently making investments on the theme of ML or AI inside, right? So it's not investing in this, we're not investing in ML, but it's um, new business facing applications that ha that utilize artificial intelligence in order to leapfrog um, a, a relative to the incumbent um, application. So so those are some of the themes. So so we start with the market and then work our way down to the company on on the you know one of the shorthand um, rules a partner gave me. Um, early in my career is you can't make a big company in a small market. So you have to pick the markets that you think are going to be big. Um, and then personally, I really like to see entrepreneurs that um, entrepreneurs who have a unique angle on that market. So why, you know, they, they've been a customer, they've been an engineer in that space. They come from a parallel different market that where they can take learnings from that market into into a new market or create a new market. And so, but I really think um, having, you know, especially in the earlier stages of a company when there aren't a lot of customers yet and isn't a lot of revenue and numbers to analyze, what you're really investing in is the entrepreneur and you, you need to see, you know, her or his unique insights and ability to to do something different um, and successful in that market. And uh, tell me, do you, you have a very interesting story about an entrepreneur that reached out to you? Oh, yeah. So um, this happened uh, quite a while ago, but it was it was really good experience to have early in my career as an investor and early in my career as a board member, because it was important and it's germane to what's going on in Silicon Valley now in a way that's different. But one Friday afternoon, you know, after five o'clock, I'm in my office at the firm, um, tidying up my desk and getting ready to go home to my family for the weekend. And the phone rang and I picked it up and it was one of my CEOs. And I'm like, hey, how, you know, how's it going? He goes, uh, okay, actually not so good. I'm like, okay, what's up? Thinking we'd lost a big customer or an executive had quit or something, right? Yeah. You know, the, because you, the, the rule of thumb, if you're, an, if you're an entrepreneur, the rule of thumb is call with bad news fast. Like, don't email yeah. it, don't, you know, call and call right away. So uh, I said, so, okay, so what's up? And he goes, well, you know I've been having some problems with my drinking. And I thought to myself, hmm, no, I didn't, I didn't know. Um, in fact, I didn't, I didn't know he had problems drinking yeah. and, I didn't, and I certainly didn't know that they had reappeared. And it, so I said, no, no, I didn't, but why don't you tell me more? Yeah. Um, and he launched into the story that, uh, that he had been an alcoholic, um, had been sober, but um, in the past months had started drinking again. And that week there had been a company offsite and he had gotten very drunk at that offsite and uh, made a fool of himself and, in fact, injured himself not seriously. But the important thing was not only had he fallen off the wagon, the entire company knew. And so, you know, so it quickly elevated to a board-level issue. What do, what do we do with this CEO? Um, and so the other investors and board members um, and I, you know, 
huddled intensively. And what we decided was to give him a second chance because he had come clean to us so quickly. Um, yeah, he'd been honest, right? And that's you know they, that's the rule with my kids. If you do something wrong, yeah. and you tell me right away, yeah. you know you're going to be punished for doing something wrong. But I will, uh, you know, I will understand. We all make mistakes. And but it if you trust, right, it? right, exactly. But if you do something wrong, and then you lie about it, your troubles are squared, right? <laughs> it's not just additive. You've squared your troubles, um, and and as you keep lying, it compounds. Yeah. And so don't do that. So. With this company, you know, we had the CEO sign an agreement with us that he would we, he would have a plan where he would get sober, where he would be in counseling if he had, you know, any any intake of alcohol was an immediate firing offense. So pretty much like very much on the straight and narrow. And to his credit, uh, he stuck to that and um, rebuilt his trust with the team, and in wow. fact, you know, drove eventually drove the company to a positive exit, and wow. and we remain friends to this day. And one of the other investors even backed him in his next company. So, you know, it, it's so stressful to be an entrepreneur. I mean, this is something that I learned when I became CEO of Hackbright. I, I had always looked, you know, talked with my entrepreneur friends and they would tell me how stressed they were that they were always on the verge of throwing up. And I'm like, ah, you know, don't be over dramatic. You've got this. And then, and then I was in the seat and I had to eat my words. I mean, uh, every night, you know, multiple times you wake up yeah. in the middle of night, you're worried about cash, you're worried about that person you really, you know, you really should let go, but you don't yet have a good, replacement for you're worried about that big customer you're trying to land you're worried about if you then launch the new marketing campaign will it be effective getting the new customers and you're worried about cash and you're worried about cash we were bootstrapped we were really worried about cash um and in our case we also had this big mission we're trying to accomplish so we're a company but it was a, a mission driven you know very uh, socially oriented team and um I felt a huge, you know, I, I, along with the team, felt a huge responsibility to women and to, broadly speaking, in tech and to the tech companies. I and mean, we often talk about Bureau of Labor Statistics forecasts that there's um, a million unfilled software engineering jobs in the U.S. by 2020, right? There, because every company is having to become a, a software company, right? It's not just Silicon Valley venture-backed companies. I'm on the board of a large industrial public company. They wanted Silicon Valley software expertise in their welding and pump company. Um, and with a million unfilled software engineering jobs, you know, we felt it was our moral, we do feel, it's our moral obligation to make sure that half of them are filled with women. That's a half a million jobs um, to try and train women for. So it's a very ambitious scaling objective. Um, so, so at this point, I am far more sympathetic to, uh, to the entrepreneur side of the table. Something I really love about the ecosystem, and it may have been maybe more in the old days <laughs> after seven years, but that many of the VCs, you know, go to the other side of the uh -huh. table or have been on the other side of the table. And I think, you know, when I first came here, they said it was a cottage industry. And in that way, I think that really showed up because you can add so much more value, not just the money, but... Uh, support, as you know, because now, wow, you're 10 times the VC that you were before. Right. So. right. And I, I think there's not, I mean, there's clearly not a sing, one single path or one single background that makes somebody a good venture investor. No. You know, it's a, it's a very diverse group yeah. of people who are successful venture it's investors. It, yes. Yeah. Um, but I think having, having operating experience can make you out of the gate a more helpful board member to to your entrepreneurs because you're just so much more empathetic with them. Um, Thank you so much, Sharon. It's always a delight to see you. Thank you.